The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 14. My husband, enjoying some intermission of his almost continual ailments, had a mind to go to Orleans and then into Touraine. In this journey my vanity made its last blaze. I received abundance of visits and applauses. But how clearly did I see the folly of men who are so taken with vain beauty. I dislike the disposition, yet not that which caused it, though I sometimes ardently desire to be delivered from it. The continual combat of nature and grace cost me no small affliction. Nature was pleased with public applause, grace made me dread it. What augmented the temptation was that they esteemed in me virtue, joined with youth and beauty. They did not know that all the virtue is only in God and His protection, and all the weakness in myself. I went in search of confessors to accuse myself of my folly and to bewail my backslidings. They were utterly insensible of my pain. They esteemed what God condemned. They treated as a virtue what to me appeared detestable in His sight. Far from measuring my faults by His grace, they only considered what I was in comparison of what I might have been. Hence, instead of blaming me, they only flatter my pride. They justified me in what incurred his rebuke, or only treated as a slight fault what in me was highly displeasing to him, from whom I had received such signal mercies. The heinousness of sins is not to be measured singly by the nature, but also by the state of the person who commits them. The least unfaithfulness in a spouse is more injurious to her husband than far greater ones in his domestics. I told them all the trouble I had been under for not having entirely covered my neck. It was covered much more than was covered by other women of my age. He assured me that I was very modestly dressed. As my husband liked my dress, there could be nothing amiss in it. My inward director taught me quite the contrary. I had not courage enough to follow him, to dress myself differently from others at my age. My vanity furnished me with pretenses seemingly just for following fashions. If pastors knew what hurt they do in humoring female vanity, they would be more severe against it. Had I found but one person honest enough to deal plainly with me, I should not have gone on. But my vanity, siding with the declared opinion of all others, induced me to think them right, and my own scruples mere fancy. We met with accidents in this journey, sufficient to have terrified anyone. Though corrupt nature prevails so far as I have just mentioned, yet my resignation to God was so strong that I passed fearless, even when there was apparently no possibility of escape. At one time we got into a narrow pass, and did not perceive until we were too far advanced to draw back, 
that the road was undermined by the river Loire, which ran beneath, and the banks had fallen in, so that in some places the footmen were obliged to support one side of the carriage. All those around me were terrified to the highest degree, yet God kept me perfectly tranquil. I secretly rejoiced at the prospect of losing my life by a singular stroke of His providence. On my return, I went to see Mother Granger, to whom I related how it had been with me while abroad. She strengthened and encouraged me to pursue my first design. She advised me to cover my neck, which I have done ever since, notwithstanding the singularity of it. The Lord, who had so long deferred the chastisement merited by such a series of infidelities, now began to punish me for the abuse of His grace. Sometimes I wished to retire to a convent and thought it lawful. I found wherein I was weak, and that my faults were always of the same nature. I wished to hide myself in some cave, or to be confined in a dreary prison, rather than enjoy a liberty by which I suffer so much. Divine love gently drew me inward, and vanity dragged me outward. My heart was rent asunder by the contest, as I neither gave myself wholly up to the one nor the other. I besought my God to deprive me of power to displease Him, and cried, Art thou not strong enough? wholly to eradicate this unjust duplicity out of my heart. For my vanity broke forth when occasions offer, yet I quickly returned to God. He, instead of repulsing or upbraiding me, often received me with open arms and gave me fresh testimonials. Of his love. They filled me with the most painful reflections on my offense. Though this wretched vanity was still so prevalent, yet my love to God was such that after my wanderings I would rather have chosen his rod than his caresses. His interests were more dear to me than my own, and I wished he would have done himself justice upon me. My heart was full of grief and of love. I was stung to the quick for offending him, who showered his grace so profusely upon me, that those who know not God should offend him by sin is not to be wondered at but that a heart which loved him more than itself and so fully experienced his love should be seduced by propensities which it detests is a cruel martyrdom. When I felt more strongly thy presence and thy love, O Lord, said I, how wonderfully Thou bestowest thy favors on such a wretched creature who requites thee only with ingratitude. For if he, anyone reads this life with attention, he will see on God's part nothing but goodness, mercy, and love. On my part, nothing but weakness, sin, and infidelity. I have nothing to glory in but my infirmities, 
and my unworthiness, since in that everlasting marriage union thou hast made with me, I brought with me nothing but weakness, sin, and misery. How I rejoice to own all to thee, that thou favorest my heart with a sight of the treasures and boundless riches of thy grace and love. Thou hast dealt by me as if a magnificent king should marry a poor slave, forget her slavery, give her all the ornaments which may render her pleasing in his eyes, and freely pardon her all the faults and ill qualities which her ignorance and bad education had given her. This thou hast made my case. My poverty is become my riches, and in the extremity of my weakness I have found my strength. Oh, if any knew with what confusion the indulgence favors of God cover the soul after its faults. Such a soul will wish with all its power to satisfy the divine justice. I made verses and little songs to bewail myself. I exercised austerities, but they did not satisfy my heart. They were like those drops of water which only serve to make the fire hotter. When I take a view of God and myself, I am obliged to cry out, O oh, admirable conduct of love towards an ungrateful wretch! O oh, horrible ingratitude toward such unparalleled goodness! A great part of my life is only a mixture of such things as might be enough to sink me to the grave between grief and love. End of chapter 14, volume 1.